weather's good. I know there's a lot of other places you could be. But I'm very, very grateful that you all came out. One of the things that we do at Uncle Bobby's is try to create community space for dialogue and for writers and thinkers to come through and engage conversations that you can't have anywhere else. We also have the People's Education Center, which is next door. For those that don't know, the People's Education Center is our educational center that's right next door to Uncle Bobby's. We do community workshops, we do children's story time, we do mental health awareness, we do men's groups and women's groups, we do uh, GED training beginning in the fall. And the goal of the People's Education Center is to provide forms of education to the community that can't happen anywhere else. So between Uncle Bobby's and the People's Education Center, every year our goal is to have a few symposia that take our leaders, our intellectual tradition, our ideas, and put them at the center. And we want to have conversations about certain people, certain ideas, so that they don't get changed, so that they don't get distorted, so that they don't get lost. Every, every uh, January, we have the, Mount, the, Mark, the radical Martin Luther King Symposium. And the reason we do that is because we don't want Martin Luther King to become a thin, milquetoast, liberal, multicultural action figure. Instead, we want him to be the radical figure that he was in 1968. Every May, we do the same thing as a coordinated set of activities with other activists and organizers in the city of Philadelphia. We do the Malcolm X Symposium. I, I say that because we've been celebrating Malcolm X Day in Philadelphia for a really long time. And long before I, Uncle Bobby's was here, long before the People's Sanctuary where you're sitting was, was created, people were doing Malcolm X Day. Tomorrow there'll be more Malcolm X activities that we'll talk about throughout that day the afternoon. But today, for the second year in a row, we're doing a Malcolm X Symposium so that we can understand and discuss and engage one of our heroes, one of our legends, one of our ancestors, Elhaj Malik Shabazz. And so I'm thankful to everyone who came. I'm thankful to everyone who will endure. I know many of us are fasting, so I know that also can make this a much longer and even more challenging moment, but that's part of the journey. It's part of the struggle, and I'm grateful that you all are here for it. The first panel today is on radical education, Malcolm X and radical education. I will be moderating that panel. I'm going to say a little bit too. But I'm joined uh, by three comrades, friends, and real brilliant cultural workers who are going to help us think about the role of radical education in the life of Malcolm X. So can, uh, can you all come up and I'll introduce you as we go. We have a... Uh, we have, uh, of course, Kempis Songster, also known as Ghani. This brother right here, give this brother a round of applause. So this brother is a genius, to be sure, but he's a freedom fighter, he's a worker. Someone who was caged in Pennsylvania state prisons as a juvenile, given a life sentence. And because of the work of many people who have struggled and organized and resisted, he is home. Um, but he's done the work since coming home of restoration, of expanding uh, the possibilities of restorative justice, of, of doing work on the ground with people, of writing, of thinking, of, of doing everything possible, I think, to really embody what restorative justice can be. Give that brother another round of applause. <laughs> to, to his left, we have Mari Morales Williams, who is, I'm sorry, Dr. Mari Morales Williams. I ain't taking the is a, another brilliant um, educator. Sometimes people get PhDs and they only stay in the university. But after getting her PhD at Temple University, that's right. Well, we ain't shouting out. I ain't shouting out to you. Y'all can shout out to you. <laughs> we went to the church, I tell you to kiss my ass. You know what I mean? But that's not what I'm just doing. If I wasn't here. Um, but I will shout out her work because she um, works um, in the community. She's an organizer. She's an activist. She does tremendous work with everything from restorative justice to Blacks in Palestine. Uh, of course, Tough Girls, uh, which I wanna, we're going to hear much more about, is an important part of the work she does. She's an active educator in our schools. Uh, and she's moving up the ranks there, too. We'll talk about that. Uh, she's a brilliant sister, a, a dear friend, uh, and a, a wonderful contribution to this panel. Give her a round of applause. Philly, but he's a part of the Philly 
I mean, he, he, he's, he's such a part of our intellectual landscape. If you, he, he came, this is a brother who is supremely trained, JD from Ohio State, PhD from Temple University, supreme intellect, just like everybody else on this panel, and he could have taught a lot of places, and he made a decision to teach at Howard University, and to teach our children, and to produce the next generation of thinkers. He's been voted HBCU uh, Teacher of the Year, Professor of the Year, two different times. Uh, he's somebody who thinks deeply about Africana intellectual traditions, uh, all while managing the Department of Africana Studies at Howard University. And anybody who's ever worked at HBCU, you understand that it takes more than a notion to work, to labor, and to lead Negroes, some of whom have not learned that we are unfree and have no commitment to freedom work. And he's doing that work at the same time that he's helping expand our minds. Uh, you can also see him in the media, you can see him on, uh, on, on Twitter as Africana Carr, engaging in debates that I'm too tired to do, but you can do much better anyway. Oh, please, man. Uh, but please give a, a warm round of applause to Dr. Greg Carr. So, every year we do Malcolm X panels all around the world, and, and, and a lot of times, panels become the same conversation over and over again, and people come and give the same talking points about Malcolm they were gonna give, no matter what the topic was. And we don't grow in our understanding of Malcolm, so the, the reason why I wanted to have this panel and this conversation was so that we could talk and think about Malcolm and education. What role education played in the life of Malcolm X? Um, I just want to say a couple quick things. For me, I think one thing that I have um, been concerned about in our limited understanding of Malcolm, and our limited analysis of Malcolm in education, is that we make it seem as if Malcolm was a bad person, went to prison, got cleaned up, and left. And in that narrative, what is lost, or what is actually what is, what is constructed is this idea that somehow prison saved Malcolm X. Um, the prison didn't save Malcolm X. Malcolm X became a world historical figure despite the prison, not because of it. Um, there's some interesting scholarly work that's coming out now around Malcolm and the prison that I think is interesting. Uh, in the autobiography, Malcolm frames himself as illiterate going into prison and an autodidact who then comes out. There's a lot of research from Manning Marable's biography, which we can critique to be sure, um, but also other work that shows that Malcolm came in much more, Malcolm was somewhat humble in describing his own intellectual place. Malcolm was writing, if you, if you look at the releases in 1999 and later, Malcolm was writing letters to his sister Ella that are, he's far from illiterate. And Malcolm was engaged in study and Malcolm was talking about writing a book when he gets to prison in 1946. By the time he comes out in 1952, Malcolm has grown, but Malcolm grew for two, for, for me from two things. One, intent, well three things, one intense self-study Two, accessing the programs that he could access. Malcolm was fighting to get to these different prisons. He wanted to get to Tacoma because he knew they had more educational options. So Malcolm understood the value of education. Um, and third, and I would say most importantly, the intervention of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. You can't separate Malcolm's educational journey from the, the love ethic of Elijah Muhammad, from the role that his brothers played, his sister played, and not just cleaning Malcolm up, not just giving Malcolm knowledge of self, but linking Malcolm to a set of intellectual sources and traditions that even if Malcolm was in the best prison education program, there is such a thing, he still wouldn't have. Even if Malcolm read every book, book in the library, he still wouldn't have. So Malcolm, over the course of his life, is engaged in a lot of reading, a lot of thinking, but also a deep love ethic that transformed Malcolm into the person we know uh, him to be now. Greg, You know books, if nothing else. And you know these intellectual traditions, as we all do. What was Malcolm reading? How do you see the role of, of, of what intellectual traditions helped produce and sustain Malcolm? First of all, thank you for much. Yeah, first of all, thank you for being at the center of this intellectual work, this practice. You know, Bookstores, expanding communities, and bonds, convening. And I'm glad to hear you all. So taking notes, inveterate note taker. In fact, I'm gonna pause and lift up the name of an ancestor, someone who became an ancestor a week ago, I guess it'll be a week ago tomorrow, Anderson Thompson, one of the great intellectuals in our tradition out of Chicago. Um, they said Anderson Thompson thought it was his job to come to every meeting and be the note taker. And he organized for really almost 60 years. In fact, anyway, but let's hold another thing. But, so thank you, but, um, I think you framed it. It was institutions. The only time I met Wilfred, his oldest brother, who was the co-founder of Token Number One in Detroit.
Detroit. I recruited Malcolm into the nation. Um, was the bookstore store. I was in front of Vaughn's bookstore. Many of y'all know Ed Vaughn out of uh, Michigan. Uh, one of the great old bookstores. Uncle Bobby says, join this tradition of these great old bookstores where people are in this, in this convening. I was uh, at the Association for Study of Classical African Civilizations, our ASCAP conference in 1995 in Detroit. I snuck away to go to the bookstores. That's what you're supposed to do, go to the bookstores. And come around and get out. I'm in front of the bookstore, and this little rat trap car pulls up. And I, was, I just come out of Vaughn's with bags. And this little dude gets out of the car and says, where are you going on the bags? He's like, I go back over to the ASCAP conference. You, you know the ASCAP is in town? I said, yeah. He said, what you know about this bookstore? I said, what? Who are you? Express my ignorance. He goes in his pocket and unfolds a, a folder. Y'all seen that card? Uh, Y'all may even sell it across the street. With uh, Mr. Michaud, Louis Michaud, who owned the uh, bookstore on 125th Street, and Malcolm X on one side, and Elijah Muhammad, I'm sorry, uh, Muhammad Ali is on the other side. <laughs> and he, 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 he points at this carved up card. He said, Who is that in the middle? I said, Mr. Michaud. He said, All right, you are with me. That was Paul Lee. Paul Lee, though, you know, one of the great researchers that we have still living in Highland Park, Michigan. Highland Park is like a Bantu stand in Detroit. You know, it's Detroit all around in this little neighborhood of Highland Park. One of the great researchers of Malcolm X. He said, I'm going to bring somebody over to the conference this afternoon to meet y'all. He walks in with Wilfred Little, Malcolm's brother. And in listening to Wilfred talk, we got a sense of the intellectual genealogy of Malcolm X. Of course, parents Garvey Ives. Mother from Grenada, secretary in the Garvey Chapel. They moved from Nebraska to Michigan. We all know the story. But more importantly, Malcolm grew up in a literary household where intellectual work was at the center of his practice. So you framed it well, brother, I think very, very, very seriously. And when we think about how Malcolm continued in that practice, you know, listening to Paul Robeson, you hear Malcolm's diction, you're hearing the imprint of his father, the other Garveyites. Literacy is at the center of this. In fact, I thought about it. I jotted down a couple of notes today because uh, Earl Grant, by the way, just made transition. One of Malcolm's lieutenants in the OAAU. Peter Bailey, who wrote his uh, memoir a couple years ago, witnessing Brother Malcolm X, the master teacher, had a thing for him last week in D.C. But at Malcolm's, at the center of his practice, of his intellectual, was constantly reading and then translating what he had read for people. Last thing I'll say, and we move on, just to open it up. The intellectual traditions for Malcolm seem to come out of a tradition where what you read, what you, first of all, study, discipline, study, reading, instructed, kind of directed reading, and then taking that stuff, absorbing it, and translating it in conversation to empower folks. So that for Malcolm, teaching, I think about, uh, what's the brother's name? Benjamin Kareem, the guy who introduced him the day he got shot. Guy killed was in the OAM. Benjamin Kareem said in his book on Malcolm that Malcolm X was first and foremost a reader. He would visit him at the house, and he said, I grew up in his study, he was surrounded by books, he was always writing, he was always reading, and then he would talk to me about stuff and read and chew through stuff. And when you think about that, it reminds me of Ely Wazell. There's a new book out on Ely Wazell on how his teaching methods. His teaching assistant said, Ely Wazell would say, whatever else I am, a writer, a trainer, I am first a teacher, and I'm in conversation. So Malcolm's intellectual work, his reading was formed in, in reading and then translating, reading, debate, reading, conversation. We see him in prison, we see when he gets out of prison, he's always in the bookstores, he's sending people out to get stuff for him, like John Herbert Clark and others. And so that intellectual tradition is one where you don't read stuff to keep it to yourself. You connect to a place like Uncle Bobby's. You debate in there, and then you translate that into political action. I'll say some more things, but I think broadly you framed it well when you talked about how he went about his work. Connie, one of the things, again, we, we, I said it earlier, but I would, I'd love for you to say more about this and, and other pieces of it. Um, that is about the role of the prison context itself. You know, there is a narrative that Malcolm was saved in prison, and therefore we attach to prison a certain kind of salvific power, this idea that, that prison can save you. Um, and that ed ed the educational experience of Malcolm in prison was one that if you just, you know, if you just hunger down and just do what you're supposed to do, you can come out of prison much better. Can you talk a little bit about, in the context of Malcolm, but also the bigger picture of prison and, 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 and education possibilities? So, I also have to thank you for, for organizing something like this and making, you know, Malcolm X and his relationship to education, radical ex education specifically, like what's going to set the tone of this conversation. So that it's not just another panel where, 
you know, the panelists try to say the flyest thing about now. You know what I'm saying? To get applause, we walk out inspired, and then about a few hours from now, it's, it's business as usual. You dig what I'm saying? Um, what is the practical value of Malcolm's life, especially as it's related to and shaped by education, radical education? And there is a practical value, especially in this era of mass incarceration, where there is nobody in this room, I am sure, that don't have somebody that they love that's behind the walls, right? And um, we all want them to turn out, you know, the best that they can be. Me personally, I also am not from, from Philadelphia. I live in Philadelphia now, but I ended up in Philadelphia because in 1987, about a week before I completed the ninth grade, I ran away from Brooklyn, New York with a childhood buddy to Philadelphia, 100 miles away, chasing street dreams and, you know, adventure and things like that. Got hooked up in some unsavory ac activities and company in this city. And just four months later, still at the age of 15, you know, um, a brutal crime took place that I was directly involved in and I was sent to prison for the rest of my life. At the age of 15, sentenced to life without parole. It's only because of a series of US Supreme Court rulings particularly Miller versus Alabama and Montgomery versus Louisiana that said that it's unconstitutional to sentence children to mandatory life without parole, then I'm honored to be and blessed to be sitting at this table with y'all today talking about something so serious as Malcolm. Um, and that's after 30 years of incarceration, right? So I've been home about 17 months now. But the, and, but, but the thing is, you know, even though I ran away from home and my mother came home one, one day and I was gone and she didn't know if I was alive or dead for a long time. And I, you know, I didn't even consider that, you know, in my own selfish way. It's kind of like how Malcolm talked about his mindset at the time. You know, he was only a teenager too. He was 19 years old too. Um, but and even though neuroscience, you know, weighed into this, this issue of uh, juveniles being sentenced to life without parole, you know, Malcolm's brain didn't suddenly reach full blossoming at the age of 19, you know. So he was still irresponsible in his decision making. But not to be discursive anyway, I, who the first person you thought when I got arrested that I got on the phone and called? My mother. Even though I disrespected her like that. And sure enough, she came down all the way from Brooklyn, New York, on Amtrak train to the police station with a bag full of what she thought I would need, clothes, pajamas, underwear, and three books. And one of those books was the autobiography of Malcolm X by Alex Haley. Right? The autobiography of Nelson Mandela was another one. And Mark Mathabon is Kaffir Boy. But the first book that I would read in my prison experience was the autobiography of Malcolm X. That was the book that opened me up to everything else. You know what I'm saying? A path to consciousness within the prison context that would amount to me chewing up hundreds, maybe thousands of books over the course of 30 years. You're damn right. I know personally that, Mal that prison didn't produce Malcolm X any more than it produced me. Remember what, what Malcolm X said in his in the autobiography? He said that you know there wasn't enough hours in a day to read the books that I wanted to read. And the most dreaded time of the day was 10 o'clock when the lights went out. But there was a light coming in from the outside of the cell and I would lay there and read the books. And then when I saw the guard coming, he would run in the, I would run in the bed and jump in the bed. Why would he jump in the bed if, you know, what he was doing was accepted or supported? He was doing something that the prison didn't support. You know, he had to hide to do it. You know, he had to wait till the guard go past and then go back. You know what I mean? And, even in, and he also said in the book that uh, uh, the, not the, the warden and ten guards couldn't pry me out of the book. So he's letting you know the normal position that prison takes about, you know, us reading, especially reading certain type of things. You know, it, it wasn't that much different than back in slavery times. You know what I'm saying? We, we weren't allowed to read. You know what I mean? And even now, even now, if you see the book, the, the banned books list for the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections is this thick and includes books like Blood in My Eye by George Jackson, um, the autobiography of Asana Shakur, you know, um, and even now, uh, uh, New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. 
and the autobiography of Malcolm X. Right? So the prison system is still anti-self-education or anti-homemade education as Malcolm would, would talk about it. You know what I'm saying? So you're damn right, man. Uh, when we educated ourselves within the prison context, we had to sneak and do it. We were reading material that was banned, that we had to sometimes get smuggled in. You know what I mean? Just to become aware, just to become conscious, just to regain our humanity and moral rectitude. And sometimes when the guards would come in the cell to do your shakedown, the first thing they would confiscate from you is your books, is your reading material. You know what I'm saying? And this exists to this day. You know, the DOC just implemented some of the most repressive de dehumanizing policies last year ever with the banning of books. You know, the relationship between education and decreased recidivism is well studied and researched. Why would you ban something that helps somebody to become a better human being? What, you know, what kind of human being is the prison industrial complex trying to produce? They're trying to produce the kind of human beings that keep the business going, that you can guarantee to come back. And so, yeah, so not to be late with the point, man, but um, education, you know, Malcolm was the template, man. He was the template, he was the role model. He was who we read and learned what it means to, be, to transform ourselves, to tap into the locus of our own agency and find our way and pull ourselves back from the ruins, confront our shame, you know, our self-accusing spirit, the whole nine, man, Malcolm showed us that, man. He showed us that we, it, it could be done, because if it wasn't for Malcolm, we'd be wallowing still in shame about the blood that's on our hands, the pocketbooks that we snatched, the homes that we invaded. You dig what I'm saying? And Malcolm showed us that there not, not only is it a way for us to, um, to forgive ourselves, but it's a way to to find our way back into the good graces of the human family by joining the struggle to make our communities places where violence and victimization are no longer characteristics of the community. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, wow. I mean, you know, we could go on and on about that. That's my long-winded answer to you. No, no, that's a great answer to you. That's, great answer. that's why we're here, bro. Mike, I want to talk a little bit, and then we're going to circle back to all these questions again. I, I want to I, I talk a little bit about institutions and community and their relationship to, to, um, to Malcolm and also the broader question of radical education. I think, because one of the things that I said earlier that I've always been concerned about in the, the autobiography of Malcolm X is that Malcolm overplays what he didn't have at first. In a sense of saying, I'm illiterate. You know, I, I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that. When Malcolm actually came with a, a fairly strong sense of self and purpose, he was studying with Shorty Malcolm Jarvis in prison. In all the other biographies, you know, he's like, oh, me and Malcolm studied, we came in and said, he said the moment we got the, the, the guilty sentence, we knew that we had to learn everything we could to make sure we never went back there again. So, so they, Malcolm went in with a certain sense. I, I, could, I could theorize about why Malcolm underplayed his educational abilities. I think he was doing it in the service of a bigger mission. But the question, but what I worry about is in doing so, Malcolm may have not identified all the people, all the networks, all the communities that helped create him. How important are those communities, those networks, those people, not just for Malcolm, but for, for the bigger conversation about how radical education works? Because I would imagine you can't just do it by yourself. Um, I mean, to answer that question, I think we have to also consider the people in his communities that also brought him to that place. Right? And so I teach about the school to prison pipeline with my young people in large part because of Malcolm, because Malcolm wanted for young people to be able to think for themselves and to be able to understand what's at the root of your pain, who taught you to hate yourself. And so when I think about the school to prison pipeline and the community that shaped Malcolm, I think about his teacher in the eighth grade who told him, well, I know you want to be a lawyer, but that's not for black people. Why don't you be a carpenter? And so, you know, if we're not also thinking about who in our community is teaching us to, to hate ourselves, then we're not also getting at the root as to why we do in the first place, right? Um, and the, the role that teachers can play in helping us to uh, think about knowledge of self. When we think about um, the role that his 
um, family plays in terms of the, the letter writing and the literacy that goes into letter writing and how prison so oftentimes encourages folks to be disconnected, isolated from community and to not be able to see that you're connected to something bigger than yourself, right? Um, his siblings become a critical teacher for him in that way. Um, I think also a part of what he was recognizing was that because he was steered away from school by his own dreams being squandered, uh, that as he was starting to engage in this letter writing, his vocabulary wasn't fully expressing all of what he sort of had within him, right? And so before he gave, you know, began to read um, W.E.B. Du Bois, he starts to read the dictionary and write down every single word from the dictionary and to sort of build that vocabulary, right? And so there's a way in which um, words in and of themselves, the histories of these books become a part of his community, yeah? Um, and I think the role that community plays is in really uh, playing back to, to Malcolm his own reflection, right? Um, in terms of thinking about, well, who am I in uh, relationship with? Who else has also been carrying the pain and suffering of white supremacy within their bodies and beings um, that doesn't necessarily allow them to see within their community the, the very resources that we, we've always had, right? That as much as poverty has been, played such a big role in terms of us not being able to realize uh, our dreams and to realize uh, our, our dignity and, and our worth, uh, that being a part of a community that's cultivating a critical consciousness is what will ultimately bring us back to ourselves. And I think that's a part of what Malcolm is, is encouraging us to sort of think about how do we come back home to ourselves, right? How do we sort of become the teachers of, of love of self so that we know how to engage uh, within community uh, that is still experiencing ongoing race-based trauma, that's still experiencing the trauma of the prison system, that's still experiencing uh, the trauma of school uh, that's not necessarily allowing us to, to, to see reading and literacy as these vehicles for self-liberation and collective freedom. Body, I'm, I'm going to go come back to you. And and I'm hearing names come up. I heard John Henry Clark uh, today. I've heard, of course, John <laughs> Max. Uh, we talk, Henry Clark, we can talk about Tilda Schomburg. Um, so many of our most profound leaders, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, right? So many of our most profound, Marcus Garvey, we could go on down the list, didn't do this work in school. Either because school wasn't available or because school was hostile to their intellectual ambitions, etc. How significant is the out of school space for thinking about radical education possibilities? Well, I think outside of the person. Y'all can jump in on this too, don't I don't want y'all to feel like it's a. I think out of school spaces um, mean that you get to engage in the kind of radical education that Ella Baker talks about when she says that to be radical is to get at the root of a problem, right? And so if we're not getting at the root of the problem, a part of what uh, sort of state sanctioned schools do is just sort of blame us for our own misery, right? And not give us the lens to be able to see, well, if I'm not the, the maker of my trauma, how did we get here in the first place? And so spaces like uh, Tough Girls, which really sort of um, learn from organizations like Youth United for Change, Philadelphia Student Union, um, Girls Justice League, all youth organizations that are clear that if we're not teaching our young people about political education, then, uh, then we're not teaching them exactly why they're experiencing the community violence that they see. Uh, and you, it's hard to do that within school when the state has such a strong role in terms of what critical consciousness looks like, right? You're not able to do some of the level of um, healing work that's required for folks to feel encouraged or confident to really confront some of the pain that they are experiencing or seeing at a, at a community, at a society, at a global level, right? And so out of school, uh, you're able to uh, fully meet the, the full range of needs that a young person might have. Um, you're able to uh, see, literally meet that person where they are, 
right? When I think about the very beginning of uh, Tough Girls, I met most of those girls, if not in the community center that they were going into, but <laughs> on the block while they were playing double dutch, uh, as they didn't necessarily feel uh, like the community center was for them uh, because it was where the squares were, right? And so you need to really uh, connect with You're able to connect with um, folks who uh, don't feel like school is for them, right? And you're able to help them to reimagine what their educational journey could look like um, in a space that they could be a part of. So, <coughs> I think it was Jay Gillen in uh, his piece, Educating for Insurgency, a book called Educating for Insurgency, The Roles of Young People in Schools of Poverty where he talks about in the middle of the last century, public schools and secondary schools were conceived to operate as factories churning out workers to meet the demands of assembly lines and industrial bureaucracies and to the consumption of products made in the factories. Today, the dominant analogy is that schools should be like laboratories of scientists experimenting for initial conditions and inputs, controlling for specified variables, right, to induce brain states to meet the demands of an economy structured by the scientists and the consumption of digitized products, right? in public schools of relatively comfortable adolescents. These ways of thinking might work to produce the necessary workers and consumers so that the bourgeoisie could continue to go about their business. But in schools of young people of poverty, particularly descendants of enslaved people, right? These two analogies, the factory analogy and the laboratory analogy is inadequate. Neither the young people themselves, their parents, or their teachers can look through these frames and make much sense of anything that they see, right? The factory schools can't prepare students or young people to, or for factory jobs that no longer exist. Right? And the, today's experiment-based, evidence-based, data-driven schools can't prepare Af Af young African-descended children and poor children to even, you know, take math and science courses for credit in college. And so it, 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 it doesn't qualify them for anything more than service job be done by a few years anyway. Right? Or right now. And so this question that you're asking, right, about sites of radical education is at the heart of what the school to prison pipeline is about, right? When we talk about school to prison pipeline, I hope we're not thinking just in terms of because the school has metal detectors and school police in, in, in the hallways. That's not what makes the school to prison pipeline. And if we assume that, then we're assuming that by removing the, the, the metal detectors, and the police, then the school to prison pipeline is effectively dismantled. No, everything, like, like, like Mari said, the school to prison pipeline, yes, yeah, a catchy multi-hyphenated word that we use today, but it's been existing for African people in this country since we've been going to school, right? And, you know, even back in Malcolm's time, when the teacher told him, you can't be a lawyer, he was flushed down the school to prison pipeline. Make no, no mistake about that. When you have curriculum that doesn't, you know, it's not based on hope, right? It's not based on facilitating healing for, for students that's making their way from toxic homes, through toxic neighborhoods, to toxic classrooms, in socially toxic environments, right? If, there's a, if it's a curriculum that's not you know what, about facilitating hope and healing, you know what I'm saying, within that, then you're dealing with a school to prison pipeline. You know what I'm saying? So, any site 
of radical education. It doesn't matter where it's at. You know, it can be in prison. That's not to say that radical education can't happen in a college. Look at you. Look at you and look at you. You understand what I'm saying? But the site of radical education has to be wherever we set up shop to educate one another. It's about what, what Malcolm talked about. It has to be about cultural, cultural identity. You dig what I'm saying? Helping you to realize yourself and that you have a larger role to play in this world. It's not just about churning out compliant workers to fit into the status quo to become a battery in the matrix. Education is not just about getting a good job because Malcolm didn't educate himself to get gainful employment. He died broke. Mandela didn't educate himself to get gainful employment. It was never about a good job. I mean, sure, we need a good job living in a capitalist society, but for them, education was about what education means in the etymologic root from the Latin word educari, which means to bring out, to draw out. It's about drawing out and bringing out the best in us, right? Making us politically conscious and helping us to tap into that distinct human capacity to put our minds together, to look deeply at society, look deeply at the world, see what's anti-life about it, what's anti-human, what's anti-nature about it, and come up with ways to fix it. That's what education did for Malcolm, right? And that's the model that we follow, you know, from behind the walls. And we can set that up anywhere. It doesn't just have to be behind prison walls. I wanna, I wanna talk, before go we go, I wanna talk about behind the walls. I, I, wanna, I wanna bring Greg back in for a minute, because I wanna talk so that from folk that know Malcolm well, but know different dimensions of Malcolm, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about what Malcolm specifically was engaging intellectually, just a little bit, in terms of his trajectory. If you could talk a little bit about that, because there's this, Malcolm from 46 to 52, when he's incarcerated, is reading a wide range of stuff. But then, by the time you get to 65, Malcolm has made several interesting moves. He's engaged a deep Africana tradition. He's heavily engaged in freedom struggles on the continent of Africa. He's, he's thinking deeply about Ghana. He's thinking deeply about Egypt. Um, he's thinking very much about uh, someone like a John Henry Clark who will talk about, you knew John Henry Clark very well, would talk about Malcolm and the intellectual relationship that was there. Um, and, and, and so Malcolm isn't just a Hajim Leach man. He's also is Omawale. He's also Omawale. Right, so, 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 so he's engaging in a variety of traditions across, across the gamut that I think we often don't give sufficient attention to in, 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 the, in the kind of thin transformation story we tell of Malcolm. Could you talk a little bit about some of the ideas, some of the figures, some of the big figures or, or key ideas that Malcolm was engaging over the, over the course of his journey? Yeah. Appreciate that, brother. Um, now on the clock, I know you got to keep it moving. So um, first of all, this isn't the sexy part, this kind of, these conversations we're having. These are very difficult. I appreciate what you said, but it's not, it's not a it's not the kind of thing that kind of gets people feel good and disappears. This is where the hard work begins. Um, some of the names I mentioned a minute ago, but I'm gonna go back just for a second. When I said Paul Lee met me out in front of uh, Ed Vaughn's bookstore in Detroit, Vaughn's bookstore in Detroit, like Uncle Bobby's here, like Hakeem's was here, like the true bookstore from 52nd Street, those who remember Dell and Lee Jones and all that people's revolutionary party and all. These are places where Vaughn's was a place where organizers met and talked. So when you see the Republic of New Africa emerge, for example, in Detroit, Imari and Gaidi over Delhi, right? The last public speech Malcolm gave was in Detroit, 14th of February, 1965, week before he was killed. For their organization that they renamed the Malcolm X Society that becomes the Peace of the Republic of New Africa, right? And Queen Mother Moore, a lot of those reparation activists were in uh, D.C. two weeks ago, they're gonna be in the Cobra in Detroit in June. The institutions, the out of school spaces you mentioned, Malcolm is being informed by these institutions before he goes to jail and then after he goes out of jail. Remember, he's released into the custody of his eldest brother, Wilfred, who I mentioned. He co founded the Nation of Islam, Temple Number no. One in Detroit. Another autodidact who went to jail because he wouldn't fight in World War II, Elijah Muhammad, Elijah Poole out of Sandersville, Georgia. Mother Claire Muhammad, we'll hear more about it. A lot of people here know that story, we'll hear more about it. But my point is that. When he's writing back and forth, like you say, to his sister and them, right? When he's in Boston before he goes to jail, y'all are trying to get him in line. But remember, the Garveyites, again, his mother is the secretary of the, of the UNIE chapter in Omaha, right? Coming out of the Caribbean. And so we know those who are from the Caribbean know that, 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 that value of education that is implanted in the mind. So 
his mother is coming. But by the time he gets to the eighth grade, if you remember, remember when Kabila had been paying the, uh, the storage fees in Florida and they put everything up for auction and then eventually the Schomburg was able to pull it back off auction so the archives at the archive. When they debuted part of the, the materials, I went up there to kind of look at the stuff they had on display. One of the things was a journal Malcolm kept before the eighth grade with his classmates. We're talking about institutions where you had, he was in integrated schools, but those weren't the only places he was learning in. He was a top student, as you said, before he encountered this white dude who started in that little town and who died in that little town, probably, trying to pull that dude back to his dreams. But he came there literate, as you say, but he's being nurtured by intellectual traditions and networks that preceded him. The, 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 and, and of course, Garveyism has a lot of conservative strands in it as well. There's some europhilia, we can get into that. You know, it's, but one of the things is this emphasis on literacy, which is where I really want to go with this in terms of these, these networks. So when he gets out of prison, when he's released to his brother back into that kind of intellectual milieu, then when he ends up in New York, and by the time he comes, like you say, into his full consciousness, after he spends some time in several cities, including this one for several months, what was it, uh, Malik and over here, what is it, like 56, I think he was here? That summer. And of course, you see some correspondence between him and Jeremiah Shabazz. That's another kind. A lot of people in here will talk about this. This literate tradition of letters, right? And, and let me say this right quick before I continue for a second. And that is this question needs to linger with us. What does it mean to be, to have out of school spaces? I would argue now that we don't have them. Why? Because this is out of school. <laughs> we don't have a place where we are not connected anymore. So when, you know, um, Anya is here, Stephanie, a lot of people fill up the freedom schools. And we read Manny Marable's book when it just came out with Brother Brother Mosley. And then we took it apart by comparing it to primary documents and going through it in the second terms of this, this, these networks. There are two pieces, I think, that are very important in this in terms of critical literacy, as you say. One is the close reading of texts. That's something anybody can do at any time. You see the prison kind of, you know, I'm going to read this book. Tell me what book to read. I'm going to read this book. So, like I say, when, um, uh, when Benjamin Kareem visits Malcolm at the house, he's got Shakespeare in there. Why? He read Shakespeare in part because he liked the language. He's trying to master the language. Not reading it for content necessarily, but if you listen to his parables, his metaphors, a lot of his farm language. The box and the hymn. That's, that's the farm boy stuff. Like he said, I'm old farm boy. But the language is coming from those texts he's reading in prison. But indiscriminate reading can be problematic. There are only a couple of books I know that are explicitly about how to teach Malcolm X, teach and learn. One of them is by Amadi's mother. Teresa Perry, teaching Malcolm X. She also wrote Young Gifted and Black, edited that way, so you. And the first half of the book is critical reading, critical literacy, critical reading of primary Malcolm X stuff by high school students. Just read this and respond to it, write back to it, have a conversation. But the second part, and this is where I'm going and where you think you can raise the question, this is the problem we have. Because we don't have the out of school spaces, in other words, because we don't have the institutional spaces, where the literature is introduced as part of curriculum, as you said, and instructed kind of back and forth critical literacy. And the word I always talk about a lot, because this is what it was taught to me by Anderson Thompson and others, genealogy. What is the th what are the things that preceded the moment we came in this room? I mean, this little pamphlet, the last speech Malcolm gave, I just pulled out a couple of stuff, a couple of things out of the archive. This is the pamphlet that Cobra still says. This is the guy, Eddie Brothers, who put this in a pamphlet and they sell it, give it something to you know, raise money for Ann Cobra. But they have study groups. The second thing is the genealogy. So this is where I end with it. Malcolm, Mr. Misha was telling him where to read. Bookstores, out of school spaces. But not just a place you buy books. He comes in there, who's in there? My Angela, Carlos Moore. Everybody, you know what I'm saying? So when he meets Fidel Castro at the Hotel Teresa, that's across the street from the bookstore, you know what I'm saying? So I mean, so I'm saying that conversation, these are not unconnected, these are all out of school spaces, and then who's out there on the sidewalks? Who's, who's interacting with them? The next generation who then brings that genealogy to us, and we're not inventing the wheel with critical literacy, you gotta tie it to a genealogy, because our open enemies have institutions that go on and on and on. One of the things he gives in this last message that he gave the 14th of February, 1965, Malcolm stands before a crowd at Ford Theater in Detroit and says, the media, the media will rewrite everything. This is what white institutions do. Front page days, New York Times talks about Venezuela collapsing. No, talk about the American embargo. Talk about, you know, talk about Palestine. No, we can't do white. But since, since you don't have a genealogy, since you don't have institutions, we know we can just tell this lie to you, and you can take the newspaper and teach critical literacy, but without genealogy, you think it's the first time y'all had this, so you don't understand the rhythm. Meanwhile, our institutions train our young people to go and learn everything that happened before in terms of how it's learned and then apply it to this condition. Your tradition now is to talk about critical literacy as if this is the first time you had the conversation.
see Malcolm, by the time we see Malcolm, he appears as having been imprinted by several major institutions, including the Nation of Islam, including the UNIA, and then when he leaves the planet, the Republic of New Africa, which still exists in many ways, reparation conversation that new, tell ta all the time, I'm grabbing glad he's in it, institutions, Paul Coates, ta father, who started Black Classic Press. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Who's publishing some of this stuff. So I guess what I'm saying is that Malcolm, in terms of those giants you mentioned, I named a couple of them, and maybe, I was just trying to think of maybe one more, in addition to his, his sister, who would be, well, you mentioned John Henry Clark. Malcolm, the assassination of Teresa Loomis, huge, right? Malcolm would send people around Clark, say, to his house to get files and information. So when you hear Malcolum talking about Patrice Lumumba, when you hear him talking about Africa, it's very important to understand he's being informed by networks of scholars, networks of folks who are building. And when he makes that trip to Africa, when you see his diary, which was published by a black press, black press, this is the hot third world press, Haki Mabuti, right? That's in that stuff that got saved. When you see Malcolm writing about Nkrumah, when he goes to Ghana, who does he meet up with? You know why he knows my Angelou? In part because Mr. Me shows bookstore. I mean, she's over there now. Well, guess what? Everybody from David Levering Lewis to a major figure who doesn't get talked about as much as we should, Julian Mayfield. This is the Ghanaian, Ghanaian, Pan Africanist community. He's in East Africa. And when he comes to do the OAU, it's being informed. He's able to travel like he is in Africa, but in part because of the relationships he's built through those networks. Those are not networks in schools. And being critically literate without a genealogy just means you get to be smart in public and can't fight other institutions. Let's, um, I want to save some time. We, we actually want time, which is wonderful. Um, we are, y'all want um, <laughs> Well, let's do some Q&A. I want to make sure we engage you all with questions. If you have questions, can I see your hand? Are there any questions? Questions? I'll come down. And no, I'll, no, I'll probably talk loud enough. I, I'd rather not because it's easier okay. for people who are able to hear. Okay, understood. Um, but let's make sure that we uh, keep thinking of questions and, and good questions. Um, good afternoon. My name is Demetrius. I'm from um, Camden, New Jersey. Um, I think when you think about Malcolm, um, I think it's important to see how education um, built him as an individual and how he projected the education and used it, uh, sort of like Dr. Carr said, used it to liberate our people. So um, how could we teach our young people and just people in general, that education is just not something that you gain to get a job or a career, but to build you as an individual, to liberate your people. Because again, when you talk about liberal, a book in Spanish is liberation, it's freeing your mind. Just like the brother mentioned, freeing your mind is something that they don't even want you to do in prison. So how can we project that and teach our young people the importance through now? Uh, Monica, can you, can you speak on that a little bit? So just to give a little context in terms of where I teach, um, which is for sure shaped by Malcolm in terms of um, you know, working with young people who have been displaced from the Philadelphia school system. So I work at an alternative high school in Kensington uh, where on average our young people have gone to three to four other district schools. And they're there for 101 reasons, perhaps previous incarceration, previous pregnancy, um, or just being overlooked. Right? And so when they come to our school, one of the number one things they really want to know is, to your point, like how is this going to help me sort of gain a job? And I think a large part is because they're trying to survive economically. And so it's really hard to try and have some deeper education, right, if they're coming in hungry or if they're coming in really trying to think about, well, I know I might be hungry when I go home. And so if we're not, also thinking about giving economic opportunities to young people, like real economic opportunity, then it's hard to, to do this simultaneous education around their history, their pride, their healing, um, some of the, 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 the nuts and bolts of what they need to survive spiritually, right, and mentally and, and culturally. So I think it has to be a, a combination of um, giving them economic opportunity that they can um, have some stability for, while also recognizing that uh, a, a part of their survival is also trying to like interrupt these cycles of trauma that have been passed down from their parents. So we also have to help to radicalize um, our therapists, our counselors, so that as they're engaging in this emotional management of 
continuing to navigate the hood, continuing to navigate racial capitalism, that they that, that they're helped, right? That they're seen, that they're embraced, um, and that they're able to get some of their basic needs met as their their mind is also um, being challenged and informed and enlightened. Hello. Yep. Hi. Um, thank you all for being here with us this afternoon. Um, I have a question, and then I want to give you a little background on that question without getting too into detail. So my question is, how do the people in each of the institutions that you all have relationships with negotiate um, a relationship to the category of the human as being basically excluded? Because from what you all have articulated, it seems like you're really in, invested in talking about and instilling a sense of interiority um, into, in, instilling that interiority, but also articulating how that interiority is um, established and constructed on the part of like Malcolm's background and his experiences and thinking about how Wadi is um, sort of doing this radical self-care work with uh, students in the public school system. And so I wonder if you see at all um, the people that you're dealing with understand their relationship to the category of the human based on these institutions as being essentially excluded, right? Or if that's not a thing at all. And what I mean by being excluded from that category is I'm literally thinking about laws that laws and even something like the mental health industry that cannot account for the psychic interiority of black people, right?
I feel worse and worse. Henry Jr. just wrote a piece, uh, I guess it was published somewhere, it just came, I just saw it today, on how literacy, see, literacy and freedom, literacy and political art are molded together. But the disruption of literacy by the spectacle has created a notion where people think they're literate when in fact they're just literate in images and moving stuff around. And so at Howard, the number of students who engage in critical literacy, when I got direct supervisory responsibility with them, grades, which seems like going anywhere. Many of them still won't read. The finesse is the coin of the realm today. How do I avoid critical literacy? And they don't see that as a diminishing of their humanity in the world. They see it as uh, an amplification of their humanity in the world. When in fact, what they're becoming, as Giroux and others will argue, are just commodities to be moved around and bored by people who never question right, right. their humanity. And I think that that's that's where I don't I don't have an answer for that where I work except to recruit a few out. I don't call it petite marinage or brown marinage. I just call it trying to get some Negroes away from the Negro factory. Or as, or, or as, or as finally, or as Bill Scott Hammond wrote when he was 19, was he 19 when he went to the president of Lincoln University and said, just let me have a semester off so I can finish my book. And he was it the vulture? Did he wrote first at the Negro factory? Well, which one was it? It was the vulture, right? This guy was at Lincoln University, goes to the president and say, man, just give me the rest of the year off. I gotta finish this now. Today, you probably get college credit for that. But today you write a book that may be made into a great video, but it might not tell you anything else. And I think the hollowed out literacy is the challenge we have now. It's people presenting as literacy when in fact they are not. It has diminished our humanity. So we are we're right at 4.15. I want to be as good with time as possible. I want to give you two a, a final word. What I'd love for you to do is each of you give a final thought. It could be on that question or anything else you want. And I'd also love you to tell the people the work you're doing very quickly, like what organizations you're working with, and if, if you'd like, how they can support you. Because y'all are doing this work on the ground. Um, so building off that last question about the importance of black interiority within the prison context, it's impossible to separate Malcolm's radical education from the prison context. He even talked about how, look, he said, if it wasn't, and, and he wasn't making a case for prison when he said if it wasn't for this experience, the prison experience, I wouldn't have turned out how I turned out. You know, if I didn't, if all the distractions, and that's the word he, he used, if all the distractions wasn't removed, you know what I'm saying, where he can able, be, what was able to go inside. And that's what we all have to do when we're thrown in those dungeons and we find ourselves in a situation that makes absolutely no sense. Whether we're innocent or we're, we're not innocent, but we find ourselves in a situation where we have to confront not just external powers, but our inner demons. You follow what I'm saying? And we're caught between those two things and it can drive you crazy. You follow what I'm saying? If you don't also have, not just what Malcolm had, books, but you also got older brothers. You dig what I'm saying? That walk that path. You follow and, and show you where to go. And I had the blessing of running into some old generals freedom fighters that was buried alive. I'm talking about political prisoners, former Black Panthers like Russell Malone Schultz, and Joseph Jojo Bourne, Mike Africa. You understand what I'm saying? And political prisoners who have been traveling the path of consciousness for a long time, and they saw a seed of something worth investing in, and they put me under their wings. They said, read this, read that, read that. Get away from this, this Negro stuff, this slave stuff. Right, learn your culture, right? Learn where your loyalty system supposed to be, you know, reside. You follow what I'm saying? And, 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 and here is how you deal with your inner demons, right? Giving you Amos Wilson and Naeem Akbar, right? Black psychology, Wade Nobles, Marimba Ani, helping us to define why it is we did the nut stuff that we did, not as an excuse, but as an explanation so that it can lift the weight, the crushing weight of guilt off us so that we can function. Because right after us, we're also every day looking at lines and lines of more young brothers being marched in in orange jumpsuits and shackles and cuffs every day like slave coffers coming through. And all of them are dealing with poor psyche poor self-perceptions, a sense of a historicness, 
No kind of cultural continuity, just aimless, lashing out at each other. You dig what I'm saying? So a lot of us, you know, learning from these old generals, these old freedom fighters, we learn how to form curriculums, like cultural awareness curriculums. Started reading Chancellor Williams, you know, Destruction of a Black Civilization, and Sheik Antediop, African Origin of Civilization, and Francis Cress, you know what I mean? And, 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 and Hakimatu Buti, and all of these books, the, the, the Journal of African Civilization, by Ivan Van Sertima, and going through that whole school and that ori reorientation of realigning ourselves with who we are, forming curriculums. I'm talking about actual elaborate courses for other young people coming through. You know what I'm saying? This is what we were doing. And we, you know, and so yeah, black interiority was we, we had to go inside. We had to throw the curtain up over the door and, and turn the lights out in ourselves and confront those inner demons and look the face, look. Conjure up the face of the person who our face was the last face that person might have saw. Right? And say, man, listen, man, I'm so sorry. It wasn't supposed to go down like that. You dig what I'm saying? This is on a, on, on a personal, from a lived experience perspective I'm telling you about. It's not something that you're going to find in any book. You know, we didn't have a script. We didn't have a manual on how to do this, so how do we find ourselves, and so we know, we definitely, but we had to go inside, man, and we had to help each other do it, we didn't have degrees in it, we didn't know what we were doing, but we just knew that we had to find our way back, you dig what I'm saying, into our humanity, because we know that our mothers didn't raise us to be beasts, our mothers didn't raise us to be predators and enemies of our own community, right, and that's the role that Malcolm played, if he could do it, we can do it, right? And this is the lesson moving forward for everybody in this space. You have a loved one on the inside, you have to invest in their development from out here. Send them books, engage them. When you talk to them on the phone, ask them how you spend your days. Because I was in there with a lot of them dudes. I was in there with your brother and your cousin. And I know them dudes. They might put on a different face for you in the visiting room, but I know them. Some of them, some of them stand up, some of them ain't. Some of them sitting at the poker table, some of them spending most of their time on the basketball court or hiding under the steps smoking K2. I know, I know them. And you have to engage them. Ask them, what do you read? And here, look, I'm gonna send you a book. Let's read this together. All right, y'all know you want me to put your money on your books and all that, but. Look, here, read this, and let's talk about it and see where they at in principle. And you have to be hands-on the way the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was hands-on in the development of Malcolm. You have to be hands-on in the development of your cousin or your brother or your son. Right? Yes, Can't be no realer than that. Might have the last word. So, to this point of the, the power of engaging young people, one of my favorite sort of speeches from Malcolm is in 1965 when he's addressing a group of young people from SNCC um, and he's talking to them about black people are the only people that get, that get told and sort of taught um, to be nonviolent in a violent world. And I think that's a really important thing for us to consider as we're engaging young people and giving them space and room to feel violent. I feel like Pam Africa has done a beautiful job of this really sort of pushing people to think about, we have to understand why young people are angry, right? And give them that space and that room to, to validate that. And to say that that's a part of the human condition in a dehumanizing world, giving them the space and opportunity to also think about what do we do with that emotion of violence, right? And how can we channel that? How can we sort of push that to really teach them to fight? Right? In a way that is not only transforming themselves, but also transforming the conditions around them. Uh, so a part of the work uh, that I'm excited to get into within my school is moving into being a director of culture and climate. And oftentimes when we think about culture and climate or climate managers within schools, it's this really a uh, racist narrative that it has to be uh, the biggest brother in the building to, to strike the fear of God into young people into making sure that they don't, right, sort of continue this path of, of harming others, as opposed to we need to really sort of get at the, the root as to why a young person is coming in feeling violent and engaging in 
violence with themselves and each other and really create conditions both for relationship building that is centered in um, uh, humanizing our, ourselves, understanding the, the larger sort of um, patriarchal, transphobic, ableist, capitalistic ways that keep us disconnected from ourselves and, and encourage this kind of violence. So when Malcolm is saying that the most disrespected black woman, the most disrespected person is the, is the black woman, I get to see that every single day in school. And so if I'm not also working with our, our young people um, around the, the political education to understand why that is, then I'm not doing my job and none of us are doing our jobs, right? If we're not sort of thinking about the, the very context that, um, in, that encourages young people to be violent. And so I think continuing to uh, work with um, and, and see the full humanity, the full complicated pain that our young people are trying to, to articulate, um, that are really um, engaging that sort of cognitive dissonance. How do we how do we see our young people and create more spaces for them to continue to see themselves um, and to say, I see and understand why you feel violent because you're reflecting what exactly has been given to you, right? So how do we give them the tools? How do we give them the space? to engage in this violence in a way that is uh, tearing down these systems that encourage that in the first place. Um, and letting them, and it's not gonna come out cute in the beginning. They might curse a lot in the beginning, right? They might, um, they might be disrespectful in the beginning, but that really encourages us to invest in their growth and development and to, and to believe in the long journey, to be able to love them enough to give them second chances so that if they get it wrong the first time, they're, they're not feeling as though, well, huh, I guess I'm just not cut out for this, right? We have to love them enough, we have to hold them enough to sort of see them through and have a big enough imagination um, to allow them to go through their process. Everybody, can we give another warm round of applause for Dr. Ryan Gladys Williams? Can we song soon? Dr. Greg Carr. Right, we're gonna move right on to the next panel. We're gonna take just a, just a five minute break to get folk up to the stage. And, Cause I wanna stay on time cause it's hot. And again, a bunch of folk is fasting and it's Saturday, right? So I wanna make sure we, we, we are on, as on time as possible. So I'm gonna ask the next panelist to come up. I'll introduce you when you're up here. Just take a three or four minute break. If you wanna shop for some merchandise, I won't be mad. All the panelists have books up here. Feel free to grab one. We got sweet potato pie. You don't even got to leave. You ain't even got to leave the church. You got to buy it, but you ain't got to leave the church. It's right there, right there on the other side of that door. Uh, sweet potato pie, beverages, coffee. We got everything you need. So please make your way up. And uh, again, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.